very much. This evening, I'm very pleased to introduce um, Dr. Adenei, who is one of, um, he's the head of department here in family medicine at Cecilia Makiwani Hospital, as well as emergency medicine. Um, and he's very well known in our department. We work together for his excellent presentations on ECGs and anything to do with um, that first line approach to the patient, especially in the emergency setting. So we are very pleased that he has joined us this evening. Um, so he's, oh no, yeah, he's a head of department and also a senior lecturer at the Department of Family Medicine and Rural Health at Walter Sisulu University. Um, and he has a background both as a basic life support trainer in the Eastern Cape, and he currently heads the resuscitation committee for Cecilia Makiwane uh, Regional Hospital. Uh, he also has a huge history in, in research and has an NRF C2 rating as an established researcher with a wealth of research experience and supervises many of our registrars with their MMEDs. Uh, Dr. Adonai enjoys mentoring in emergency medicine and transitioning of patients to the chronic care model. And is also passionate about treatment outcomes of HIV, PMTCT and non-communicable diseases. And as a family decision, he has a special interest in communication skills as an effective and therapeutic tool to be deployed during consultation with a patient. So we are looking forward to the presentation um, this evening. Thank you, Dr. Adonai. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to ask you to, um, to, to share your screen and, and take us through this presentation. Thanks for the introduction. I'm very glad to be here. Um, over the next one now, I just want to uh, praise our you know, basic approach to look, you know, managing cardiac arrhythmias in, in the various district hospitals where we may not readily have access to cardiologists or better still, the phys you know, physicians who can then immediately provide backup uh, uh, in terms of uh, care for these patients. Uh, in terms of uh, what our expectations are over the next hour, I just I would like to take uh, every one of us through the normal cardiac rhythm and more importantly to then come down on the cardiac arrhythmias and the implication for, of, of such in terms of the patients we may see, uh, especially in the middle of the night when you are all by yourself. And of course, we'll look at the various class uh, the classifications of the arrhythmias in terms of making progress with the care of these patients. Um, I must say, this is a non-cardiologist level discussion. And as such, we will be appraising uh, uh, the recommendations from American Association uh, guideline of 2020, vis-a-vis -vis the European Society of uh, Cardiology of 2019. And then of course, we'll look at our own local guideline, Resuscitation Council of South Africa, vis-a-vis -vis what are the medications that are readily available to us in the various district hospitals. Uh, we are all familiar with the uh, Pohingya fiber system, uh, looking at the uh, conductivity, you know, conduction of electrical activity from the central atria node and as it transitions to the atria wall into the AV node where it gets slows down. And then, of course, it's, uh, you know, transferred uh, across the east bundle and the, you know, and they put the uh, left and the right uh, fascicular branches you know, and then of course, uh, through the atria, uh, ventricular walls to the various parts of the, uh, of the heart. Now, this is the normal expectation as the atrial wall depolarizes, we generate the P wave. And also we'll expect within every cardiac cycle, you will see the P wave coming first in, before the QRS complex, which signifies the ventricular depolarization. And of course you then see uh, the ST segment plus the T wave, so, uh, you know, uh, suggesting the period of repolarization of the ventricles. This is what we expect to see, uh, in, you know, in a normal cardiac cycle. And by implication, we know that typically patients under physiologic uh, uh, stimulations, you will see patients responding uh, with heart rate above 100. But again, we we'll still expect that the P wave uh, will still be maintained as the main driver of the conduction uh, within the heart. And as such, 
the P wave and the QRS complex, uh, complexes will follow uh, one after the other. And then of course, the, 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 the T wave will then follow. Uh, these physiological responses, or usually the heart rate will be above 100, but you, uh, you know, not more than, uh, at best less than 150. And typically we do not uh, need to treat or uh, you know, provide emergency care, but rather we'll simply focus on the underlying etiology in this category of patient. However, we may see additional symptoms that are over and above the underlying etiology uh, in some of the patients, uh, especially when patient, uh, some of our patients have used uh, uh, illicit drugs, amphetamines, cocaine, uh, and ecstasy. You know, these are very common in some of the communities, and therefore we need to keep an eye on some of these. And usually, these patients will have infusions of sympathetic hyperactivation on pre at presentation, and we must be ready to provide uh, uh, management for these patients. Now, we, we, within the normal sinus reading, we expect regular and consistent uh, 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 morphology of the P wave. And of course, the QRS and T waves following the, that. But typically, the heart rate will be within 60 to 100 in, in these patients. When this happens, and the PRE interval is within the normal range of uh, three to five small uh, scares or 0. 1, 2 to 0 0.2 seconds, you know, and of course with positive deflection in lead one and two, uh, we would then say these patients have got sinus, uh, uh, normal sinus rhythm, okay? However, we may have sinus bradycardia in which case the heart rate falls below 60, but again, the P waves and the QRS complexes still following one another. And of course, you may have sinus tachycardia in which is above 100, but again, the P wave and the QRS complex maintains normal consistency in morphology, you know. Uh, however, any, def any deviation or from, from this normal, any deviation from any of this normal pattern will then be classified as arrhythmias in this patient. But why should we really bother about cardiac arrhythmias, especially uh, in our, when you are working in district hospitals? We know that we are the first of, uh, point of call for most of the patients in the community. And as such, patients may present with features of hemodynamic instability, in which case the patient will typically be reporting to you with signs and symptoms that can be explained by the hemodynamic instability secondary to the arrhythmias. And again, some of these arrhythmias may be life-threatening. As such, if we misdiagnosis uh, uh, cardiac arrhythmias in these patients, it may mean sudden death in some of these patients thereafter. Not only to measure, we equally must take cognizance of the risk of other cardiovascular events, such as stroke, if, you know, in some of the patients with arrhythmias, if we misdiagnose them or we fail to act on some of the patients. Then there are some pertinent questions we need to ask ourselves. In every patient we see, it's important for us to establish the, the, you know, the, the diagnosis of arrhythmia in this patient, and what are the implications of this diagnosis for both immediate and long-term risk uh, to the health of this patient. If the arrhythmia is well toler tolerated, essentially, where if there, is, there, there, there are fusions of hemodynamic stability in this patient, this obviously will give us opportunity for patients to be worked up and perhaps we can book the patient for, for cardiologists or physicians to review. But again, which, especially when you are in an emergency setting in, your, in the district hospital, when these patients present, we need to be asking ourselves a very basic question. Does the arrhythmia require emergent cardioversion? And I think this is one of the critical uh, outcomes for this talk this afternoon or uh, this evening. Does the patient require urgent hospitalization and walk up for this arrhythmia? And should, does, in addition to providing immediate care, does this patient need anticoagulation or the medical therapy or a need for specialist consultation? And if so, when should this decision be made? These are the questions that we are which we often confronted with when we are on uh, uh, placing on call in our district hospital. 
Uh, in terms of what we need to know, very basic approach in terms of the classification of the arrhythmias, all we need to be able to quickly identify is the QRS complex. Is it narrow complex or wide complex? If it's narrow complex, we can safely assume that the arrhythmias is originating from above the AV node. And of course, if it is wide complex, we simply then make it, you know, a distinction that this is ventricular in origin. And this classification that's shown here is essentially giving us the various op op possibilities that we can see in some of the patient. Uh, I might want to make a basic assumption that every one of us can identify atrial fibrillation. Even by simply popping the pulse of the patient, we are all used to irregularly irregular pulse. And this we should be able to pick out on ECG. Um, atrial flutter, again, the typical circuit appearance we, which everybody is familiar with. But atrial tachycardia, especially when the focus of the electric activity is somewhere outside within the atrium, but outside of the SA node, then we may have Ecto, you know, uh, atrial ectopics. And again, we may have atrial premature beats in which the driver of the, uh, of the electric activity is outside of the SA node. And oft typically we, may, we should be able to recognize this because the morphology of the P wave will be abnormal to the rest of the P waves within the ECG. What about AV junction? Again, uh, for those who are familiar with uh, ECG, who have been working, you know, using ECG for a bit, they may be able to recognize this, but I, I will show a few examples of this. But ventricular touch carrier, typically we see the wide QR, you know, uh, uh, typical white complexes uh, on the ECG. Uh, and often than not, they, it may be sustained or not sustained. And ventricular fibrillation are those that uh, do that's a pre-arrest uh, 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 waveform. And typically these patients, often they're not, they are usually very unstable. Either they come in gasping or they have already, they, they, they have already stopped. Uh, their heart has already stopped and we should be able to immediately defibrillate and immediately commence uh, resuscitation in these patients. And of course, with time permits, we'll look at bradycardias, including AV blocks as well. Um, SVT, uh, typically as the name suggests, the supraventricular tachycardia is a very common uh, arrhythmia. In fact, it's the commonest uh, uh, arrhythmia we will see outside of uh, atrial fibrillation in our practice. And even though there are no local data in terms of the epidemiology of SVT, but globally it's believed that 35 uh, people per 100,000 person years will survive SVT at some point. And of course, it's more in women, uh, twofold uh, increased risk in women, and of course, five times uh, 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 more in elderly individuals. Um, when it does happen in younger patients, believe that the rates are definitely far higher. And of course, it can may occur as a long presentation. And this one reason that patients will assess emergency units. Um, in pediatric patients, though not as uh, frequent, but we may see it more in males, just likely about 52% in, in males uh, in comparison to female pediatric uh, age group. And the commonest one is in the series is the what typical of Parkinson White syndrome, in which you see the slowed up slope of the uh, of the right uh, uh, you know right half of the QRS complex, or what we typically call the delta wave, is what gives it out. But the PR interval typically less than zero point one two uh, seconds, uh, and that's how we are able to differentiate that. But typically, how do these patients present? For those that are presenting with symptoms, palpitation is the number one uh, uh, complaint that the patient will present with. And they may be very tired on arrival, they will report lighter deadness. There may be just discomfort or shortness of breath. And of course, if there are futures of uh, uh, peripheral hypoperfusion, the patient may have altered level of consciousness on arrival, and they may have even fainted be prior to, to presentation to the facility. 
And of course, few patients uh, have been found to certainly die from CESVT. Uh, this is a typical presentation. I put a case, uh, a patient history here. A 19 year old rushed into the emergency department after sudden onset of light headedness and had fainted uh, prior to presentation. He reports tiredness and barely could work by himself. The voters uh, are shown uh, pulse rate towards 162 on arrival and respiratory rate of 28 per minute, oxygen saturation 94%. And the ECG is shown below. Uh, the first question here is what additional investigation would you like to carry out? And how would this patient be managed? This is the questions we need to ask ourselves uh, when this patient present. But I think uh, even though the blood pressure seems so okay, we could see that the patient's heart rate is above 150 which means there is no enough time for the astolic venous return to take place. And definitely every cardiac output, ejection fraction uh, in each cardiac, you know, at every contraction uh, systole will be impaired, uh, will be reduced gradually. And therefore patients will suffer from uh, peripheral hypoperfusion at some part. And therefore time is of essence in terms of the uh, action that we need to take. Now, the approach to this patient would then be that if depending on whether the patient is still able to talk, like in this patient, the patient was able to give history, you want to take a focused history and quickly examine your patient. But, and also we want to ensure that we apply our ABCD approach in which you ensure that this patient airway is patent. And of course, breathing is not impaired in any form. And you may need to, provide oxygen if needed, especially if the patient's saturation is above 94, you mean there may not be any need for the oxygen supplementation. But typically, if a saturation is below 90, you will have to supplement with uh, oxygen in this patient. And also, we want to quickly put on a monitor secure IV line. And uh, again, when you, just, you know, with the moment you, you, you secure IV line, you may need to take blood for arterial gas or gently so that you can begin to look at the underlying etiology. And the history that you have taken may actually be a pointer to the tree, you know, precipitants of this SVT in this patient. Uh, in the, especially for the young people, dr you know, drug substances are a good example of, uh, you know, precipitants in, the, in most of the communities. But in addition to that, you, you, since you have full blood, you have secured IV line, you may equally want to get uh, blood for full blood and tyro, uh, TSH is enough to exclude, to actually quickly uh, rule in or rule out uh, tyro, you know, uh, hyperthyroidism in this patient. And of course you want to look at the renal function of the patient. Um, a 12 lead ECG is very, very crucial because then that helps us to actually uh, cone down on the underlying, uh, 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 you know, etiology in this patient, in addition to what you may have obtained from the history. And we are accessible, you know, uh, at a later stage, patient may have access to more uh, uh, options of uh, investigation, which will include uh, exercise ECG, 24-hour uh, ambulatory ECG, which should be done by the cardiologist. But uh, in our district hospital, our immediate approach would be to provide, uh, to do those basic investigations, you know, while we, we, we manage this patient. Now, we have already taken history. We've looked at what are the immediate causes of uh, this uh, SVT and, we have reasonably, uh, you know, uh, provided IV access to the patient in case we need to give drugs for the patient. Now, what we do next depends on the hemodynamic stability of the patient. There are five cardinal things we must quickly look for. As we take this, as we do the vitals, we want to look at the blood pressure of the patient. Is this patient hypotensive? Is this patient's a lot, okay? And is this patient having fusions of shock on arrival? And typically, again, uh, ischemic chest pain could be part of the presentation of this patient on this, from the history. 
And then you can actually confirm this when you do the full 12 lead ECG to equally pick fusion surfactor, uh, you know, uh, in my myocardial infarction as the precipitant in this patient. And of course, some of the patient may have fusions of acute heart failure. Even when you listen to the shares of the patient may have beat uh, beta crackles, you know, uh, in the patient. If the answer to any of these five is yes, there is no time to waste. These patients need immediate cardioversion, okay? Now, but however, if the patients, if the answer to these, these uh, uh, futures are uh, no, then we would then say the patient has got stable, uh, uh, you know, tachycardia, uh, symptomatic tachycardia. And therefore there's room for us to, to provide uh, additional, uh, uh, you know, Adi you know, we can actually go ahead and uh, interpret our 12 lead ECG and make, <clears throat> and make a quick decision as to how we manage a stable narrow complex or stable uh, wide complex uh, tachycardia. Now, the, uh, the, the, the interesting part is for those patients with narrow, uh, narrow QRS complex uh, tachycardia, especially when the wide you know, QRS is less than three small scare, or scarce or 0.12 seconds, we can reasonably uh, we can reasonably perform uh, what we call modified Vasava maneuver. And a lot of when we say Vasava maneuver, essentially we are stimulating vigorous uh, uh, vigorous innovation of the heart to slow down the heart rate. That's essentially what we are trying to do. Now, what a lot of the a lot of what we used to do have actually been shown to have variable outcomes, you know, and I put carotid massage here uh, in asterisk. We need to be very careful with this, especially in elderly patient is almost a no no, because you may then rupture unstable plug and create patient will simply develop stroke, you know. However, again, you you. By simply giving the patient 10 mils, empty syringe of 10, uh, 10 mils, uh, pull to two, uh, two mils mark, and you allow the, put the patient in an angle of 45 uh, degrees, and then allow the patient, instruct the patient to continue to blow out the plunger. That has been shown to generate as much as equivalent of 40 mm of uh, uh, mercury, you know, millimeters of mercury pressure. And that's what's what they what they used in the revert trial, in which case they simply combine uh, uh, Vasava Manova with rapid venous emptying by doing passive leg racing, which is what is shown in this diagram. Or we simply pull the patient an angle of 45 degrees, and we give the patient 10 minutes syringe, you know, and instruct the patient to continue to blow out the plunger through the small or uh, through the small hole. And this should continue for at least 15 seconds. And then you must have your assistant with you if you are providing this uh, technique. Your assistant stands by the bedside of the patient. After 15 seconds, you will then Put the patient to line supine while at the same time coordinating with your assistant who then elevates, who then who elevates the who elevate who is going who will elevate the feet of the patient so that there will be corresponding venous return through passive leg racing uh, to, to, to you know improve uh, you know uh, ventricular return to the heart. This has been shown to increase success in we are you know in performing uh, uh, in giving uh, uh, Vasava Manova in and this has actually uh, you know has been shown to uh, increase success rate from just standard Vasava Manova from seventeen percent to as much as forty three percent. So and there was no adverse event. In this in this clinical trial, which was done in 2015, and now this is the this has been recommended all over the world as the first step in managing SVT, and this is what we should be doing, and we should be comfortable 
to do this in our facilities, irrespective of where we are, either in the clinic or in the district hospital. And our patient can actually be taught to simply blow into, you know, against resistance for a considerable period of time and then simply lie down and elevate. Then the patient, after 15 seconds, the patient can then return for 45 seconds and then you can review uh, your ECG to see if there has been successful uh, conversion to sinus rhythm. This will be achieved, successful uh, outcome will be achieved in 43% of the patient as shown in river trial. However, if this does not work, then we are only left with provide, giving the patient adenosine. Adenosine is readily available in all our facilities. And if we don't have it, it simply means we are not fully equipped to deal with emergency. We then need to make requisition uh, to the area managers in our facilities to make sure we have it in our emergency stock. Uh, adenosine is, will simply cause transient asystole in patient, and it gives an unpleasant uh, feeling. Uh, in addition to the facial flushing, uh, uh, hypotension that could develop as a side effect, patients generally don't like this drug. And therefore, we need to prepare the mind of our patient of what they can expect. This is a feeling of dying, and therefore you need to pre-warn them. But however, the, it's, it is, you know, the conversion rate could be as high as 90%. And therefore we should be ready to immediately uh, uh, proceed to giving adenosine. How do we prepare adenosine? We simply get six milligram and we must use a two-way tap on if we are using our standard Jekyll, um, please, you must have 20 minutes range drawn up plus six, milligram uh, adenosine in different syringes so that immediately we give uh, adenosine. You must immediately flush with 20 minutes normal saline and in, at the same time, quickly elevate the, the arm of the patient. The reason is adenosine get rapidly uh, uh, metabolized by the, uh, by the red blood, you know, RBC uh, deaminase and therefore the, we need it to work within five to 20 seconds. And therefore we must make sure we have flush and elevate at the same time. If this does not work, given that the, the, the onset of the half-life is just barely 20 seconds, it gives us room for the patient to, for us to repeat to a higher dose, 12 milligram IV within one to two minutes of the first dose. And therefore, we can then uh, proceed. We expect that there should be conversion. If there is no conversion, then we may, this is at this time, we need to be looking at getting a, a, you know, a physician on call in the, our nearest uh, facility uh, to be on board while we prepare, uh, um, you know, we can prepare antiarrhythmic uh, as infusion for this patient. But most of the time, at least 90% of these patients we convert with, you know, uh, with vegan stimulation as well as adenosine. However, it's important for us to equally make sure that we look at the ECG carefully to check that they are regular rhythm. Regular rhythms are more likely to convert. However, irregular rhythm, like you will see in your atrial fibrillation, usually do not respond. In fact, we should not be doing vagus stimulation for atrial fibrillation as well as uh, adenosine. You know, the outcome is not as great. And therefore, antiarrhythmic is what those category of uh, patients will need. Uh, your IV, well, verapami and DLTSN, or better still, we may have, uh, 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 you know, beta blockers available in our facility, and that's what we should be given. For patients who are stable, these equally give us room for us to actually consult and get opinion in this patient, especially the patients who have had uh, uh, atrial fibrillation for such a long time. There is a question as to need for anticoagulation, especially warfarin, to be part of the treatment before we even start converting, depending on how long the patient has had this. And these are the reasons why we need to get opinion. Now, in, in terms of uh, safe, uh, safety of deploying, uh, you know, vasava maneuver or vega stimulation, 
we need to be uh, we need to recognize in pregnancy, especially third trimester, that's not a good option. It's not a good option. We need to be get to uh, discussing these patients with uh, uh, our referral center, and of course, patient with theostic stenosis, patient with recent myocardial infarction, and of course, atrial fibrillation and flutter. They don't do well with this. Uh, this is just a typical example of what a narrow complex tachycardia look like. Again, we, if, if we look at the lead two, our rhythm strip, we can see the QRS complexes are, you know, are very narrow. But if we put a clean paper on top, uh, especially the first three, and then we move them across, you realize that the, 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 the rates are irregular. And this is what we tend to see in atrial fibrillation. Again, this is what atrial flutter looks like. So the more of this we see, of course, we can see ventricular ectopics occurring there, you know? So we need to be able to recognize uh, these rhythms. And these are equally more. Um, the, the, this rhythm seems stretched, but the point here is I included this because you begin to see P waves that are occurring at uh, the different morphologies. This is telling us that the, the, the point of the point, the origin of the electrical activity are many within the atrium. And each of them generate different uh, P waves. That's why the morphologies are different. And that's what you see in multifocal atria tachycardia. And of course, when you have atria premature beats, you then see situation in which the P and abnormal P waves fires up the conduction, electrical activity, giving uh, 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 a whole cardiac circle that is occurring prematurely. And therefore, you see this, uh, uh, you know, this is the normal rate, but you see this cardiac circle coming before the usual rate, then they, it's before it resets. This is what you could see in atrial premature beats. Some of these uh, arrhythmias may just be accidental, incidental finding, in which case they may not be symptomatic. And therefore, this gives room for you to actually walk up the patient, you know, and then consult and get opinion on the patient. So how quickly we respond depends on whether the arrhythmias are causing associated with signs and symptoms. And how urgent should you act depends on the hemodynamic stability of these patients when you are consulting uh, uh, your patient. Now let's look at the wide QRS complex tachycardias. Again, the distinction is the QRS duration, which will be more than three small scares, or better still, three uh, larger than 0 0.12 uh, uh, seconds. 80% of these cases of these patients, uh, patients with wild complex tachycardias who have ventricular tachycardia with a pass. Okay. Now we may have a scenario in which you see a patient who had suffered from bundle branch block previously, now presenting with SVT, in which case the bundle branch block suggests wide QRS complexes while over and above that, the patient we have SVT. So these, but these are just minor variants. In, so the recommendation thereof is when you are not sure, treat the patient as ventricular tachycardia or wide QRS complex tachycardias. And these are the variations in terms of what you are going to see. Typically the P wave maybe will be absent in majority of these cases, and you may even see uh, amplitudes uh, and duration that are equal in all of these, or typically what we call monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. And you may have variations in which the amplitudes and the morphology are consistently changing, what we call polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And this we should be able to recognize uh, within, within five to 10 seconds of looking at the rhythm strip of our patient. As you can see, the amplitude here are consistent, you know, even though they are non-sustained, as you can see. But this is what polymorphic ventricular tachycardia looks like. And the management of these are typically different. That's why it's important for us to recognize this. 
in all of these areas, you know, in all patients protected with tachycardia, it's important that we recognize our basic approach, uh, ACLS approach in which the airway, the breathing, the circulation, the setting up a drip for the patient, the oxygen if needed, and again, performing 12 lead ECG must be done in all these patients. And depending on whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or not, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, it gives us allowance for us to take focus history, trying to identify the underlying cause. Because treatment should be, there can be, if we can direct treatment, appropriate treatment towards the underlying etiology, we will be able to achieve conversion in most of these patients. However, if the patients are unstable, in which case they are fusions of acute heart failure on arrival, or ischemic chest pain as evidenced by 12 lead EC demonstrating uh, STEMI, or patients having fusions of shock or altered uh, level of consciousness, these patients do, there is no time to delay. These patients may progress to uh, cardiac arrest and therefore time is of essence in terms of what we need to do. And all those patients who are unstable, we must progress straight to cardioversion in these patients. However, if the patient is stable, therefore the room, uh, we have room to proceed to giving antiarrhythmics in this patient. We all should have amiodarone available in our facilities uh, within our resource tray. Amiodarone is one of the main, one of the key indicator drugs that should be available in our tr trolleys, emergency trolleys. And we simply prepare this. We need to be careful about the dose of amiodarone. <coughs> Sorry about that. Amiodarone that we give for uh, arrhythmia, anti arrhythmia is just about half of the dose you will give in patient with shockable rhythm uh, for patient in cardiac arrest, which is 300 milligram. For patients with a pass with tachycardia, we give 150 milligram in 5% dextrose water, 150 mils of 5% uh, dextrose water to be given over 10 minutes. And these can be repeated. And if there is, if we are successfully achieved conversion of the arrhythmia, you then keep the patient on infusion at one milligram per minute infusion to run for the next six hours, which then allows us to then transfer the patient to the physician or better still, a cardiologist. This we should be able to do in our facility. And again, we, we all these patients with especially white complex tachycardia will need to have some form of uh, cardioversion done, but it's, especially if the patient is stable, then it can be done electively. The either way, we still need to refer the patient to a cardiologist. And the question as to which medication should we use uh, between procainamide and iodoron, uh, the popular procamio trial actually demonstrated unequivocally that procainamide is superior uh, in, you know, in terms of uh, the number you needed to treat to achieve conversion and also the number of uh, adverse events which we can see from this study that you have better chances of conversion with procainamide uh, versus, you know, uh, versus amiodarone, um, okay? Now, how, how do we perform cardioversion in our district hospital? I think we must familiarize ourselves to okay. Uh, our, defibrillator, our defibrillators. Most of the modern uh, defibrillators have got capacity for both defibrillation, pacing, and cardioversion. As a matter of fact, defibrillation is a synchronized cardioversion. And therefore, we need to be very careful if we are going to perform cardioversion. We must make sure that we recognize at all times that we must press the sync button 
on the machine. Otherwise, if you don't press the sync button, you are simply defibrillating your patient. And every patient that needs to be cardioverted, you must have your full resuscitation equipment available. You must ensure that the airway of the patient, the breathing and circulation have been secured. And also the patient is on ECG monitor, okay? Very important, if the patient is lucid, that we obtain consent from the patient. Because essentially we are going to be giving small, small shocks to the patient is very painful, okay? So we need to make sure we have documented consent and if the patient is not lucid, then the family, a prostate content should be obtained and documented. And therefore, we, for patients who are still lucid, procedural sedation is critical, you know? Patients are very anxious, especially when they see you grab your parts and putting parts on their chest. The people may be scared. Anxiety needs to be addressed. Pain needs to be addressed. If you have access to ketamine, that is far superior because it gives no, it not only will it give sedation, it's equally norms in terms of analgesic effect. However, if ketamine is not readily available, you may need to give midazolam, in which case the anxiety of the patient is knocked off, the, it provides sedation, but you may have to top it up by giving uh, petidine or morphine to your patient. However, the recommendation is, if any of these drugs are not readily available and the patient becomes unstable, you are to, to proceed to giving cardioversion in your patient. Time is of essence. And um, having done that, then you will have to ensure safety of your staff as well as your own safety so that you don't uh, give shock to yourself in the process, okay? And also, uh, the, the, you have interpreted your ECG and possibly if you have, uh, uh, you know, if you have antiarrhythmic uh, infusion already ongoing, that is equally fine. But better still, you need to uh, you need to immediately press sync for patients with uh, atrial fibrillation or irregular rhythm. You will need at least hundred joules for cardioversion, and for your uh, for SBT you know, you would need just 50 joules of energy to be set on the machine. And depending on whether you are using parts or paddles, that will, be, you know, it will make a difference in your approach. It's actually better if you have uh, the parts to be placed on the chest of the patient so that you, you can simply, uh, uh, you know, cardiovat, you know, hands free. But otherwise, if your parts are not readily available, then you have to use paddles, in which case, self awareness of the of safety as it's very, very important. Okay. Then for monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, you you 100 joules for ventricular, you know, will be sufficient. And thereafter, thereafter, you may need to give increase the, the, the amount of energy to, to any subsequent attempts. However, for polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, as shown here, the, the second one, this, it's important that we recognize that the moment we press sync, on the sync, we only select only the top hard waves. All the, all the lower amplitude will not be selected. And if you press sync on this, and you go ahead and you go ahead and shock the patient, you are going to precipitate ventricular fibrillation in this patient. Therefore, in patient with, in patient with uh, poly, you know, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, the recommendations are that you go ahead and defibrillate the patient with 150, a uh, 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 joule of energy in this patient without having to press sync. But for the monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, you can simply, uh, you can simply, uh, uh, you know, uh, give 100 joules to, 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 you know, to cardiovascular the patient and you will have most likely achieve success and you can repeat as, the, uh, as necessary in this patient. Once you have successfully cardiovascular the patient, if you have not already got your antiarrhythmic in, you can start commence your antiarrhythmic 
uh, amiodarone infusion while you make plan for you to transfer the patient to the nearest facility. Uh, this is a very nice algorithm summarizing everything I've discussed. And also you can have, uh, if you have access to the American Heart Association guideline for 2020, they are summarizes uh, everything I've discussed recently. And this is in keeping with the Association Council of South African recommendations. Uh, in the next uh, 15 minutes, I will just highlight important issues about bradyarrhythmias. Okay, we know that athletes who train very well, they are able to sustain heart rate below 60, uh, between 50 and 60, very 